You're listening to the Stats Bomb Football Podcast. One half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. Welcome back to the Stats Bomb Football Podcast. I am your host, Seth Partnow. I am joined today, as usual, by uh, CEO and founder, Ted Knudsen. Hi, Ted. Hello, Seth. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. That was not awkward at all. I am also joined by uh, head of football analysis, the coach, Matt Edwards. Uh, well, let's get right to the important stuff, Matt. What is your Baja Blast of the week? Uh, today's Baja Blast, I, n- this is not a video podcast, but maybe soon. I have a drink from a gas station on the side. It says really big drink. That's their sizing. Uh, Baja Blast of the week is Diet Mountain Dew mixed with uh, Pog slushy, and it is it's the best combination. It's there are a couple of different combinations out there. If you're like a Diet Coke drinker, Diet Coke with a pina colada slushy mixed in at the top. It's about eighty percent soda, twenty percent slushy or slurpy. That that's the mixture, and that's that's the good stuff right there. I feel like Matt was your nickname on the team, the Baja Blaster. No, it wasn't. It should have been. I, I, it it should have been. Did Baja Blast even exist? Yeah, when... twenty years. It's the twenty year anniversary. That's why it's in all stores. Why do you know this? <laughs> it's my nickname, the Baja Blaster. <laughs> okay, and then I'm not, now it's just true. Like... It's, yeah, <laughs> then you need to change your change your your Twitter handle to, might, to yeah. the Coach Baja Blaster. That that make it too too meta. Um. All right, football. Matt, you wrote this week about uh, edge rushers in in the combine this year, and uh, I just want to get into that. Like, um, what do we look for in an edge rusher? What have you seen in this year's class, and who are some of your favorites? Yeah. So the thing about edge rushers, I think it was interesting from the combine, is that we did get a good number of them that actually did the drills. Um, If for nothing else, they just ran the 40. And the thing about the 40 is you have the 40 yard dash and that's great. And a lot of them ran really fast because they're really athletic. Uh, But the thing that a lot of people look at is not just the 40, but the 10 yard split. So the first 10 yards. And again, I think that that is a good proxy and it's supposed to measure like get off. How quick are they off the line? And one of the things that we've done at StatsBomb is we have our physical metrics that we've talked about a couple of times on the pod where for every frame, we have a speed and an acceleration um, in our data. We roll that up to the play level where we have a top speed and a top acceleration, as well as total distance. Um, but then we take that the next level and try and contextualize it for football specific things. And so for edge rushers, we've taken their speed and acceleration. And the metric that we have is get off distance. And so on pass rush situations, we've taken the distance that a defender covers in the first second after the snap. So because all of our stuff is time stamp, we're able to line that up really easily. And so the the data that I talked about in the article had a lot to do with, we have these measurements and they all ran really fast and they're all really athletic. And, and that's why they're gonna be kind of the, the top of the draft class, but wanted to look at kind of more of their game measurements. A lot has been talked about and discussed publicly about kind of receiver speeds, Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua, the Rams had a corner on the market for these guys who maybe didn't necessarily test all that great, but have really good game speed. And that's really the only position that we've heard about it so far translating is from receiver. And so I I think that we have a lot of data for other positions that teams could be using, specifically edge rushers. And so that's where a lot uh, of the article started. So let me ask about that because I think that that the the pure like ability to run fast and accelerate fast is part of it. But I think when we're talking about translating to to game speed, it's also in that first second, we are also sort of catching some amount of reaction time. Um, the best way to actually be faster is to be earlier, right? A lot of the players who sort of play faster than they are, or it's because they're they're sort of thinking faster, reacting faster. So they're in they're, that 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 adds that adds effective speed to you. Essentially, is that is that a good way of looking at it? Do you think? Yeah, 
it does come through when you're looking at this distance traveled. There's a place specifically that I was looking at, Chop Robinson. Uh, there, there was something on Twitter somebody put out. I think it was Tej Seth at Sumer had mentioned, you know, don't bother me just looking at so and so's highlights. And, and I commented, I was like, this for me, but Chop Robinson's get offs. There's a play where the center from Michigan had snapped the ball, the ball had moved, and Chop Robinson was the first player, offense, defense, not even the center. He, he had moved the ball, but his body had not moved. And Chop Robinson was off the ball. Like his reaction time was unreal. And that helped him as he has really high get off distance. So he was one of my favorite players to watch the last year. Um, I, I like managed defense. I like how aggressive it is. But like the athletes in particular, Chop, like look unbelievable. I also liked your your little viz that you did there. So you did like a tracking data with like inter, interwoven frames around the, the couple of events there, which is like the ball snap, the briefest of blocking engagements, and then the quarterback going down. That's pretty cool. I, I think we've got, you know, because we like names here, we've got two very good names in in the ones that you mentioned in your in your article. We've got Chop Robinson and the player from UCLA. Anybody want to mention? Latu. Yeah, do it again. Laitu Latu. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, moving right along. Um, so I think that you know we've talked a little bit in past episodes about how freakish the athleticism of the edge players has to be. And in, in fact, like how some of the, the edges sort of absorb some of those athletes uh, that, that didn't necessarily used to be there. Uh, part of it is to, to make sure that the, the quarterback has pressure. Part of it is containment. I watched a lot of Will Anderson a couple of years ago when he was a, a junior and he was the type of guy that just like, he could be in the backfield whenever he wanted to. He had different jobs that he occasionally had to do, but he just kind of lived back there and everyone was scared of him. And then, you know, about every fourth play, it seemed like he took somebody down behind the line of scrimmage. So these guys seem to have so similar traits around that, different sizes necessarily. One of the verticals uh, on the player, I think it was Jared Verse. Did he have a 40-inch vert? Was that what it was? Or was it, was it the Alabama? It was Dallas Turner. That was what he had. It was Dallas Turner. Man, that's uh, at that size, at that wall, oh, so, so hard to deal with. Yeah. And I think that, like, that goes to their, when you're looking at the vertical jump, they're looking for explosiveness, right? And that shows up in this get off distance. And so for me, I've always looked at an edge rusher. There's kind of like three parts of an edge rush. It's the first part is how quickly can they get off the ball and get engaged with an offensive lineman. Like they want to beat the offensive lineman to the spot. And for us, that's where our get off distance comes into play. The that next was the thing part, Aaron Donald was most notable for, right? Like Don, Donald just always seemed to be faster than anybody else in that, much like you mentioned, Shop Robinson um, just retired this, this past week or announced his retirement this past week. But clearly, like it is, it is one of the the biggest traits you're looking for on uh, an interior or exterior lineman. Yeah, uh, the next part is getting off of a block. And again, with the data that we have, that's not available anywhere else. It's we have the length of engagement, so what timestamp that actually started and when it stopped. And then the last part is being able to finish to the quarterback. And so with our data at StatsBomb, we have the ability to analyze each part of that pass rush in a much deeper level. And I think that gives us a really interesting analysis that we're able to do uh, compared to other data that's available elsewhere. I think the other thing that's there is that you also get run disruption, which is what we've created, which is effectively a run pressure. That means that you know, you've, you've moved the, the running back probably out of his line of attack uh, and, and for some sort of problem that they have to deal with in, in the backfield. And that's also another element of the defensive line play. We're not just looking at edges these days for being able to disrupt uh, or to create pressure in the passing game. They have to be multi-talented uh, around that. And again, that's the quality of the data, but it's also using physical metrics alongside of the quality of the event data to combine that for a more holistic picture of what these guys do really well. Has the move of the NFL towards more of a passing game made the almost the specialist pin your ears back, get to the quarterback? Has that made that more of a viable guy, or is it still someone who has to be a little balanced in terms of of the ability to not just you know get to the quarterback, but also maintain discipline, set an edge, all those all those fun things in in, in the run game? Yeah, we talked 
I think it was last week's pod about players that maybe have one trait, right? Where they're able to do one thing by position and you still need to be able to do everything. And, and that's why you're going to be at the top of the draft if, if you can do multiple things. But for edge rushers, really, I mean, it's it's almost in the name, even by the position, it's edge rusher. Like they, the biggest thing that they do and the biggest thing that teams are looking for is the ability to disrupt the passer. The NFL is just such a passing league, like you mentioned. And that is where those guys are making their money. You know, they're not making their money in run disruptions or tackles for loss. It's how quickly do they get to the quarterback? What pressure can they provide? How many sacks do they get? And so it's not necessarily just that, are they only able to pass rush? Uh, but that's definitely the biggest thing that the teams are looking for. And so being able to, to give them this better information on pass rushing, I think is going to help NFL teams make better informed decisions, you know, especially at the top of the draft where a lot of money is, but those late round guys as well, where you're going to be able to find guys that maybe that is their, their best trait. And you're looking for potentially a guy that could be a third down edge rusher or, or something like that. I think the, you know, again, the modifications in the meta game, as we talked about, like which play calls open up a little more also mean that like, as you go to a too high shell, you might have to deal with a little more of the running game. And that then sort of creates interior lineman slash linebacker pressure or you know edge, depending on what type of running game you're looking at. One of the things that I, I thought was cool about your article this week was um, the, the average length of engagement and, and the scatter that you did, and particularly where Jared first was like that, that was wild. His his story is is a little bit unusual as well. It's, it's sort of a transfer portal fueled story and, and a little bit of a COVID fueled story. You want to fill in people on on the research you did there? Yeah, Jared Verse. I think to me, I've always been part of the player empowerment. I don't know if like movement or air is the right word, but um, I think it's it's great that they're getting the ability to transfer and, and figure things out that's going to be the best for them for their college career and, and set them up for their future. But And I think Jared Verse is a great example of that, was kind of a, a tweener position-wise, you know, played a little bit of tight end and defensive end in high school, had really just one offer, and it was to FCS Albany and didn't even play his first year, you know, redshirted. And then the second year was the COVID year. And so when COVID hit, he basically just worked out all the time, gained 50 pounds. And I saw, I think it was a college game day episode on him as, you know, one of their five minute things. And they were saying his coaches were just in shock when he came back into the facility. They're like, oh my goodness, you are a different looking dude. Uh, performed really well. And then Florida State's coaches were watching film because Albany had played Syracuse. And they were like, who is this guy? He's all over the field. He's the, the best player in this game. Uh, ended up that he entered the transfer portal, had a bunch of offers, and then went to Florida State and obviously is is now going to be a first-round pick. And, you know, I think that that aspect of players being able to bet on themselves and get a chance to prove themselves. You know, he would have had a chance to go to the NFL out of Albany, but it would have been a really big leap for a team to take a player like him in the first round. Like Khalil Mack, I think was a good example out of Buffalo where it's a smaller school, but he was setting college football records for sacks. I mean, it he would just have made, he made it easy for everybody yes. to be comfortable with his data set by where he went. One of the things yeah. I thought was was also a, a notable element of that scatter chart is like, you know, verse played in the ACC, Latu in the big Pac-12, whatever it is these days, whatever RAP that conference. <laughs> um, but you do have to normalize a little bit for the competition face because ACC and the Pac-12 versus Robinson facing the, the B1G and then the SEC uh, linemen. Offensive lineman play is, is considerably better in the two bigger conferences than the other ones. So, you know, you want to you be careful about the assumptions that you make or you know, be a little cautious on it. If you're just a little bit better than average in getting off stuff and you still have great production in the B1G or the SEC, that's probably a pretty good indicator as well. Honestly, we need to normalize the B1G <laughs> if we're talking about the Big Ten. The numbered conferences never make sense as yeah, they no longer the, have 10 teams. It, the, big, the big 16? Yeah. 
Uh, but we were talking about the get off distance a little bit earlier, and I just pulled up as, as we were talking from this last season, the top 10 for average distance traveled in their get offs. And Jared Burse was sixth overall. And I think that he is going to be somebody that teams are, are, are going to love as they watch this data, watch him perform. Um, for me, somebody that I think is going to be, I don't actually know where he's projected to be drafted. And it, it, you know, pain, it hurts a little bit to talk about a, a Utah guy um, in a positive light, but uh, Jonah Ellis, uh, I think at, at one point was leading the country in pressures and this was pretty late into the season. I don't know if he ended up being the country's leader, but his uh, get off distance was fourth or third. Let me pull that back up. Uh, Last Detroit Lion fans might remember, know his dad, Luther Ellis, who ended up actually being oh, his yeah. coach as well at Utah. So, uh, wasn't he a rapper he, in Miami as well? Uh, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, NFL uh, pedigree and, and everything there. So, I think he'll be a, an interesting kind of late day pick to watch there as well. One of the things that uh, when we first started coming out with our data um, and we were looking at last year's season, like I was super excited about Kalaja Kansi. Uh, guy who had unbelievable production at Pitt. And one of the cautious elements about producing these metrics and and looking at them to try and evaluate players better, especially players that feel like they haven't had good objective metrics for their positions, is you're like, all right, what is their production going to look like in the NFL as well? And for the most part, Kansi was a great pickup, uh, even as a rookie in the Tampa Bay scheme. Um, and, you know, they they also have had unbelievable players of that uh, position over the years. I think that it was it was an early signal that said that we were onto something with how we were starting to to look at the positional elements and the positional skill sets that you care about for each of these guys using stats and data to find them, service them. And then you're going to want to project what are they going to do uh, next year? So do you have a favorite of any of these guys, like ones that you watched you're like super excited by? Uh, so I, I was similar to you where I really liked watching Chop Robinson. Uh, I, I think Jared Verse is probably my guy who I'm most excited about uh, at the next level. Um, I'm a, a sucker for a good story. But then also just his ability to get off the ball, I think, is is really good. His transition from get off to power. So his, his mixture of athleticism as well as um, just size is is going to be really interesting and impressive to watch at the next level. But I think you were talking about um, Kalija Kansi and an interesting thing happened when he was coming out is that he is kind of an undersized defensive tackle and he ended up going to the same school, you know, the same university as Aaron Donald. And so a lot of times people, you know, unfairly to be compared to maybe the best defensive tackle of all time. Uh, but it was easy for people just to see that small, big defensive tackle that went to Pitt and then compare him to Aaron Donald. And I think for, for multiple reasons, I don't think that's a, a super fair way to use the, the player comp thing. Uh, I know, Seth, you have some experience at the NBA level with player comps and, and Ted at, at soccer as well. And so I, I think it'd be interesting to hear from you guys about kind of what what that looks like in a good way to do it and potentially not a good way to do it as well. I think the, the, the school thing can go both ways. There's the lazy version of it, which is, Oh, the defensive tackle from here. And this is it's tailback you. And it's like, for whatever that means, or if there's a situation, like if you want to compare two players in very similar situations, because as Ted, you were saying, you know, the context in which this, this stuff is pr is produced is can be so variable at the college level. Well, if, uh, if an Alabama edge this year and an Alabama edge last year, probably playing in a in a in a fairly similar uh, set of situations. So that that does allow for some apples to apples comparisons. And I know you 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 dug into that a little bit with respect to this year's draft, Matt. So so kind of if you want to explicate that a little bit, but then uh, we can talk a little bit about some of maybe the pitfalls of the player comp. Yeah, I think another bad example is the CJ Stroud, Ohio State quarterback, where they said, you know, there haven't been any good quarterbacks out of Ohio State. And that's just like, I mean, that's even worse than say, <laughs> Just these two guys are, are running from a, a similar school and, and they might be good, but that's straight uh, out of Moneyball, baby. What's his girlfriend look like? <laughs> Honestly, that that's a great line. 
<laughs> now there are situations where this will matter, and this is again to go, you know, back to my home turf in basketball, like you would never trust the stats of a, of a guard from Syracuse because you knew they played such a different style than everybody else that their stats were completely warped. Like if, okay, steals are a very important stat in projecting basketball players, the guards in the two, three zone at Syracuse would always look more athletic than they actually were because by nature of the way they were playing, they'd rack these stats up. So so sort of something you knew it's like, okay, well they don't get to play the same way when they move to the next level. And, and I think we've seen that over, you know, it's been forever. I mean, we can go back to like, David Klingler or something like that to to talk about like you know system quarterbacks and and why there might be some some rightful skepticism that that like some gaudy totals will project into the NFL. But Indiana that's a, that, university that's... never having an F- NBA players during the Bobby Knight era effectively or like the the back half of the Bobby Knight era and you're like oh they're they're always pretty good and you're like yeah but like it's just it's a very system problem and even though they're in the Big Ten, like the there are few athletes they you know they basically select for being able to execute a system i think that so what you've mentioned though is kind of an interesting thing where for a while you didn't want anybody that played for mike leach because you didn't understand like what was going on unless they were like an athletic freak like maybe crabtree or something like that but then all of a sudden like you know the nfl started to evaluate these guys and like actually processing time and in the passing game might be one of the most important things we have and like pretty good accuracy and decent arm strength but doesn't have to be awesome right and so you you can see things change so that the system and and the traits inside of the system actually become more prevalent ones that you want in the in the upper level. I think the comp thing is is hard because competition you played against I think is super important. Um, and and obviously system matters a lot. But then you're like, all right, what type of player is this player? And we talk to professional people inside of sport all the time. Uh, we we've met with. The, like tens of of teams across college and and the NFL, and like you know everybody kind of winces. Like you you bring up the the talk and like oh yeah you know like we we do this in the room all the time. GM scouts head of you know director of recruiting, and you're like yeah. So what's his comp? Like what what does he who does he play like? What does he look like? And you try and guide them to ones that do make some sense because you know inevitably this is how we're going to talk about players. Even if you don't like it, even if it's an imperfect thing, you have to be able to say, okay, he's a bit like this or she is a bit like this in this aspect of the game, but then they're more like this in this aspect of the game. And these are the things we're worried about is actually a great sort of second level of conversation. Um, One of the things we used to do uh, at Brentford was sometimes you get group think about a player. And we had one year where we had too much group think and it actually worked out. Uh, but the player came in with like a pretty significant flaw in that their first touch was not nearly as good as we thought it was, uh, or or we just overlooked that. And so the second year that we started doing scouting reports, anybody that got past a certain phase of the, the process, we're like, we want a devil's advocate report. And the reason why we want that is because one, we want somebody to pick apart the game to say, these are the deficiencies that we're seeing right now. And two, it preps the individual development coaches to say that these are the things you might want to work on or think about if you can work on them to strengthen them, especially in the younger players. Because for us, finding players that could develop into slightly better players was a, was a big deal. So being able to do that becomes a, a pretty significant portion. And it helps correct a little bit on the comps problem because you're like, all right, these are the things they don't actually do very well that we're going to want to be aware of. Do we still like them? Do we still love them? Maybe. But it, you know, everyone's an un, unfinished, imperfect player at the end of the day. And that's something that, you know, is important to have as an honest piece of discussion. It, it leads you to avoid a couple of mistakes that are pretty common even now. The th- I, I think that I would divide my problem with with player comps into three sort of areas. One is just the, the natural sort of anchoring bias that you have. It's It's like this guy is like that. And two things either happen there. One, you kind of agree with it, and then that's all you see, and you you don't see the the player he's being comped to as a prospect. You see them like the finished version of it. It's like, okay, this player, uh, as a college player, they looked like Patrick Mahomes. Okay, uh, what happened between Patrick Mahomes, the college player, and Patrick Mahomes now to get him to that level? And you got a dad saying, bod. Well, yeah, but but uh, but I mean, are you saying like that that sort of development curve is like okay, yes, ninety fifth percentile outcome 
blah, blah, blah. Now, maybe that 95th percentile outcome is good enough that your that 5% chance is worth it, but I don't think that's the way we usually talk about it. The second one is sort of the universe of players, like picking the right universe. Uh, it's very tempting to, if you use everyone, all the player comps, the nearest neighbor will always be someone you've never heard of. And if, but if you shrink it down too much, it's going to be too positive. So finding right the right universe of players to 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 compare it to, and then and then again the third one is that understanding the difference between prospect and player, and that's that's just shorter distance in in a lot of positions of football than it is in some other sports, just because um, the ability to sort of step in right away and make a contribution is 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 I would say higher in the NFL than it is in really uh, the the majority of other of other sports. Yeah, I think the development curve is really interesting. Um, when I was working at UVA, we would bring people in for summer camps, like recruits, right? They would come, we would test them in the 40-yard dash and a couple of other things, and we would make a lot of decisions based on their athleticism numbers if we wanted to watch them a little bit more, see how they would perform, and sometimes our, our coaches would get the numbers back from their 40s and be like, you know what, he's he's a little bit too slow. And at, at times I would look at them and say, well, this kid is 15 years old. He is not going to play college football at 15. He will be playing college football at 20 or 21 years old. So what does that development look like? There's an interesting thing I saw about Dallas Turner, who when he was in high school at these, you know, super advanced camps or whatever, he ran a four, eight forty, and, you know, that's good for a high school player. And depending on size and weight, like you would look at that and be like, you know what, that's four, eight. We, we kind of are looking more for like the four, seven for our defensive linemen, like Alabama, they're turning out these NFL defensive linemen, it, it could have been easy for them to be like, you know, that's, that's a little bit slow for what we're looking for. We're looking for more of the like four, seven, four, six, five type, knowing they'll develop a little bit, but the, the projection there as part of the comparison is, is really difficult. Uh, and I, I think when you're going from college to pro, it's a little bit easier athleticism wise, because they're, fairly developed right they spend a lot of time in a really strong strength and conditioning program they spend a lot of time getting ready for the combine or pro day or whatever they're doing and they'll develop and they'll get a little bit stronger but when you're looking from high school to college that can be really hard and i can imagine it's probably even worse in sports where not they don't have that college development you know soccer and basketball they're going professional maybe a year after high school, even earlier for soccer, right? They're like not even going to high school. So I could see that being a, even a bigger problem in those sports. The gap between a 16 year old and a 21 year old in physical development is absolutely enormous. The gap between a 22 year old and a 25, 26 year old is relatively small in most cases. So it's you know, what you're saying there makes sense. Like when you're coming out of these big college programs where you've already had you know, most of your weight put on most of your, your physical development there in the weight room. Like that's true. I think that there was a funny comment about how more of these players are coming into the NFL and they're less ready for, for doing that. I'm like, man, I don't believe that for a second. Like you, you look at how guys used to be two decades ago and what they look like when they come out of school now, and they are different players. And that's just people sort of shine in, shine in the older era and complaining about NAL in whatever way they can. Um, what do we got next, Seth? Guide us along the I, way. So I, so the, Matt said something, and this was uh, I, I'm I'm wondering if there's maybe an inefficiency here. You said they've been in a uh, a top quality strength and conditioning program. Surely there's there's a range. Is there potential in someone who maybe hasn't? Yeah, I, I, I there is. I think it would be difficult to know other than saying this is potentially a, a power five group of five. FCS, where you're going to have to create some thresholds and, and that, you know, anytime you're using any sort of weighted system, choosing those thresholds or, or how you want to weight that is going to be difficult and making sure you're going to be as accurate as possible. But I think assuming similar to how you assume kind of strength of opponent and strength of schedule, you could probably build something similar for, you know, power five, 
the B1G, as we might call it here, uh, and group of five, FCS, et cetera. So Seth loves a movie reference. Like, should we like take this as, did this guy develop into this player in Ivan Drago's training regime or was he <laughs> Rocky in Rocky four out there chopping wood and dragging things through the snow? And maybe that sub has some impact on your developmental uh, projections there. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm again, I, I comparing this, like we would know that, that, okay. Uh, for example, in basketball, like players out of UNC had generally not been in a, in a big, like lifting program. Now that was that a, was that a, does this guy doesn't know how to work or is it like he just needs to get exposed to it? It's one of those things that goes either way. So it's, it was more just something that, that, that kind of popped into my mind as, uh, as, as Matt was talking, there's sort of a concept that's been, uh, I think largely debunked, but it had some popularity for a while, which was fat guy upside, which was, Oh, this guy's conditioning is bad. He'll get in better shape and therefore he'll get, he'll become more athletic. And it was like, basically Draymond green got some, a lot of large, people draft overdrafted because I was say, is that kevin love uh yeah <laughs> i mean yeah those are those are probably two of the two of the examples there but yes but, but the, also, inver the inverse is zion right yeah but there are also i mean you know all three players were like massively productive also so it wasn't like you can't suck you have to be good and then there might be some physical upside humans are complicated i think is yes the end. I, I don't have a good segue here the, the, the thing i wanted to talk about this episode because it's been on my our minds basically since we had sort of a an aside to a conversation we had at dinner uh when we were at the combine was sort of something that comes up all the time in the sports analytics space is like the tension between being able to explain a metric or an evaluation and the precision of that metric and i think the player comp is a is a fairly extreme example of that in that is uh the precision sucks but the explainability is 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 obvious. You're saying this guy is like that guy. That's a that is a fairly straightforward, though perhaps more nuanced discussion than others. So I don't have a question so much as to say to set that as a as a conversation topic and kind of get your thoughts on that, Ted. Because I think with something that we've sort of soft disagreed about over the years without really hashing it out. So it kind of comes back to like data visualization as well, right? Like in, in all of your data viz, you're choosing levels of imprecision or levels of obfuscation. Um, there, there are imperfections to everything. But one of the areas that it became very important uh, early on in kind of pushing soccer analytics forward was making things interpretable. And, and in plenty of cases, like you want some level of information there that people care about. Um, but then in other cases, you're like, oh, I understand that, right? And people understand pictures easier than numbers in a lot of cases. Now, this is not true for everybody. Some people hate the pictures and they love the numbers or they find it confusing. But like also one of the first tenets of any sort of analysis is plot your data, right? Like if, if you're in an econometrics program, like you are plotting your data because you want to look at the shape of it and you want to understand that better. And that is kind of like a, a crucial element in being able to move forward in comfort level with that. So when I, I look at this type of stuff, I, I know that there's always a blend and I will literally change based on who my audience is. And, and I think that we all have done that. Like if I need to talk to coaches, if I need to talk to, to scouts that have like no real interest in the data element, but they want me to talk football to them and they know we've got interesting and useful information for them to know then you're willing to go in a particular direction and not talk about confidence intervals because like there's a certain point that we got to that was like look coach how sure are you that your game plan and how the opponent is going to react is exactly how that's going to be like what level of probability do you assign to that because that's what you're doing right and they're like well if it doesn't go that way then i'll adapt in this way I'm like that's totally fine when we do something and we we're, we're talking about confidence intervals and projections and predictions and whatever, we're doing exactly the same thing. We just have to assign a number to it for the most part. Um, and so you're kind of talking to them about like you operate in probability space, even when you don't know that that's the case. Uh, that brings them a little bit closer to understanding that what the numbers mean. And then maybe you can have a next level conversation and you drip feed more stuff inside of that. Players, especially depending on who they are, like they can ramp up really fast in their understanding of the of the numbers because you don't know what their their history is, their educational history, how much they paid attention in different classes. So 
I think that when I when I look at that type of conversation, it's obviously audience dependent. Um, the other element, and we can we can come back to this in a second, is just like what happens when you get AI involved and the black boxiness effect versus how much can I trust this versus you know show me what you're actually doing or give me an end number and and that's all that you get and that's a different kind of conversation. But that early bit about interpretability and comfort level with it, I think is is pretty important at least as an opening to the conversation. I'm glad you're 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 sort of. That it's sort of explicitly talking about the importance of language here in that uh, you're getting information from from different sources and how do you collate those together? And that's really the hardest bit. And I think that's the part where sort of some of the technological advances in sports analytics have really enabled us to have these conversations in ways we weren't earlier because, you know, as uh, 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 Rajiv Maheseran, the, the former CEO of, of Second Spectrum used to put it, it's like, you're finding basketball words in the data. You're finding in our, it, we're, we're trying to pull out football concepts. So a, a coach will understand not just what this number is, but what the practical effect of it means. Matt, I, I, from your standpoint, I know that as someone who sort of straddled that coaching and data line a lot in your career. I'm interested in your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I think Ted's comment um, initially was really spot on of trying to match your audience when you're sharing things that you're either finding or wanting to bring to a coach or a decision maker in some area. Communication is really important. And so being able to speak the language especially in sports, I think is really important. I think that goes for any sort of data job that you have. I mean, you're going to want to be able to speak that language and it, it helps with um, insight. But when you're talking about specifically the trade-off for um, ease of use, you know, something that I think is important and I've given a lot of people advice is start where the people are. And so if they are somewhere where they can understand a easy thing that may not be as precise or as specific as you want as a data scientist or whatever your role is, start there. And as you build trust and as you build an understanding with people, then you can start kind of expanding what you're trying to do. You know, you're not going to be able to ever really talk to a coach, I think, about like, hey, we're using, you know, an XG boost model or KNN clustering or, or whatever you're going to be doing. But being able to, one, take a difficult modeling solution that you're using and then explain it in a way that makes sense, football wise or whatever sport you're in, I think is a key. But then also as you're kind of building trust with a person using kind of easier to understand things or things that make sense a little bit to them uh, can help there. Like for me, I, I was really lucky when I was working at UVA. I happened to work with a staff that I had um, played football under as well as, as was like a graduate assistant with. So it coached with them before. So I had kind of a, a large amount of trust already built up on the football side. So where I could come to them with kind of a weirder thought or a kind of different process than maybe they were used to. And it was a little bit easier that way. You know, when we would have new people join the staff or other things like that, then I would have to kind of recalibrate how I was speaking to them or, or what I was doing. Um, but I, I was really lucky in my previous role in that I, I had quite a bit of football guy trust built up that I was able to, you know, use and, and cash in at different times. That's where the coach hat comes in, less so the Baja yeah. Blaster. Yeah. So you got to uh, have both the coach and the Baja Blast. I understand. And and occasionally you get the guy that squirts the Baja Blaster and like you're just in. I, 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 I knew I knew this, the squirt was coming and there it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> What I wanted to say was that often what we find is that details drop gradually the further up the hierarchy you go. And that's actually important, right? Because like they need to move faster. They need to have comfort level. The thing Matt mentioned about new people, like you have to build a comfort level. You have to build a level of trust and a way of talking that, that makes sense to both parties. Um, but, you know, when you're in the analyst room or when you're in the data science room, 
Like you have a different level of conversations and maybe you're using a totally different set of metrics than what you're going to produce in your next set of reports, which has a more explicable set of information, which then goes on to the GM uh, to talk to the coach or maybe to the owner, which is another layer removed and potentially more abstraction, less detail. But hey, I understand this and I can trust this and this feels comfortable for me is the most important thing. Uh, which is kind of weird when you want them to cut a very large check and you have the least information of any of right. that process. How it's it's a little bit of how dirty do I feel rounding to to one decimal place, zero decimal place, to tens only. Like it, it's sort of that question. That's the question you're sort of asking yourself in the analyst room. Is like, all right, I I know I've got to to abstract like. The, the pejorative way to put it is dumb it down. The proper way to put it is abstract this out enough that it's that it's graspable at a glance. And I just need to you just need to make sure that you're doing that at a level where no directionally this is still like this is supportable and and correct. And I'm not like doing violence to the laws of probability and statistics. So and and so I'll go with it. That combined with fighting the urge to caveat things and and knowing when the right time to to uh, as they say stand on the table for something are are some of the, the the hardest things to do in the in sort of the the analysis realm so many times it's gone both ways for me in a room like and sometimes like oh you just completely ruined our argument and our stance on this because you caveated it into oblivion and you're like okay well i'm gonna have to rebuild all of that or the other way is like oh wow you've ruined our stance on this because you've been super aggressive about it and now somebody's pissed off and they don't want to take your your perspective because you've irritated them to the point that they no longer care about your opinion thanks that was great too <laughs> matt I'll, let's end, end there matt uh, can you give an example of a time you you stood on the table, as it were? If you're not familiar with the expression. It's it's basically it's. I think it's a across sports. You're in the room. You're arguing about something. You maybe have to you feel strongly about something, and you just have to, you know, use all of your built up social capital, I guess, within the group because this is important. Damn it! And we're gonna and we need to do it this way because it's best. Do you have a, Do you have any sort of concrete examples of a time you did that? And I'll, I'll do the good one and say that, that it did work as opposed to all the times it failed, which uh, yeah. that, that definitely <laughs> happens as well. Yeah, uh, there was a time in the off season I had been tasked with doing like a big study about what, you know, it, what goes into having productive offenses, productive defenses. And one of the things I noticed is that we at UVA had been kind of an efficiency based offense, which is, you know, or, and at the time, it was four yards on first, get half the yards that you need on second down, and then convert on third down. And I went through this big study, and we just were not explosive at all. And it's really hard to score points when you are needing to go through 12 play drives to score all these points. The Joey Kanish of, uh, <laughs> of, of offenses. Yes, it was um, painful, just to, to say the least. And so I went through and, and was like, look, we need to be more explosive. And it was, a, you know, some painful conversations. And I just said, it, there were a few times where I just kind of, I don't know, stand on the table like we're talking about and just said, look, if we want to go forward as an offense, we need to be more explosive. And then that led to us eventually saying, all right, we're going to be trying to be more explosive. What do we want that to look like? And we went from, you know, kind of bottom 25% of college football in explosive plays to having the most 15 yard plays in college football. And just one season, you know, we made an emphasis and kind of changed what we were doing um, to fit kind of this new idea. And uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting to see how it all turned out, but there's a time where, yeah, you, you have to have a few hard conversations if it's something that you found and, and felt strong about. I think that's, uh, uh, other than to commiserate with Matt for the sinking feeling in his stomach, probably the first interception that was thrown that season. <laughs> uh, but but I think that's a, that's as good a spot to, as any to end this week. Uh, uh, Matt or Ted, you got anything else you want to hit before we sign off? I just want to note that i don't think matt drinks much but the the announcement that the hard baja blast was going to come out um i brought me personal delight even though i will never touch that stuff <laughs> i just felt like that was a little piece of joy in my life reflected from matt <laughs> find baja blast anywhere <laughs> in any way in any form 
Yeah. And on that note, uh, thanks for thanks everyone for listening again. We will be back uh, next week, possibly a slightly different lineup as some of us are taking our kids on spring break. Yay. Uh, and we will talk to you all then. Thanks a lot.